Good evening. Is there, is there a lot of traffic tonight or something? Because people I'm expecting are not here. Uh, we're expecting, okay. Uh, well, I have to remind you about cell phones and uh, noise-making gizmos. Um, and if you're not on the mailing list for this series and would like to be, you can sign up at the table uh, near the entrance. Uh, I'm Stephen Yunser from the English Department at UCLA, which is one of the, the main sponsors of this series, partly because we're fortunate enough to have the, uh, the aid of the Friends of English, which is an invaluable support group uh, that uh, helps the department out. Our other uh, sponsors include, and of course, obviously, the museum, uh, UCLA's Cultural and Recreational Affairs. As I think you all know, from her beginning, Sharon Olds has been one of our most remarkable poets of the body. She is, more narrowly, one of our most notably sensuous poets. And even more narrowly, she is one of our most erotic poets, <laughs> by which term I mean something like the antithesis of pornographic, uh, at least if that latter term implies, as its etymology suggests, prostitution or commerce. Eros really has to do on this hypothesis not with acquisition or with material exchange, not with holdings of any sort, but with desire, longing, Sehnsucht, with difference and separation and yearning. This is the case no less with uh, Sharon's most recent book, though its, uh, its subject is at the far end of the erotic experience. The volume is entitled Stag's Leap, and which is a winery, of course, that some of you I see know, and there is an allusion in the, in the title um, to that winery. Uh, and it's about uh, falling out of love. Uh, it's about divorce. Uh, divorce, uh, which as William Carlos Williams wrote, is the, the sign of knowledge in our time. <laughs> It's still our time, that's almost 100 years ago that he said that, but it's... If the tone weren't all wrong, the book could have been called The X-Files. It's about the relationship between the poet and her ex, after all. But X is a notoriously polyvalent term, it stands for the, the unknown, not to mention the, the kiss in the email sign-off. Or, or is that the O that's the kiss? I never know. Uh, it probably depends on how you kiss. <clears throat> and of course, for the uh, X for the contraries of multiplication and cancellation. Um, Sharon's poems, the new ones, feature what we might call the X qualities, foremost among which would be extravagance, by which I mean a wandering out of the way, an excursion into unfamiliar territory. One indication of their extravagance is their exuberance when it comes to diction. In the absence of the loved one, what the poet has, and what has even caused that absence, she sometimes seems to suspect, is her enthusiasm for her medium, Poem after poem is a cornucopia of rich, often rare terms, and time after time we are surprised by reckless term speech and exotic tropes. Whether she's conjuring nearly indescribable sounds that sleepers make, or the sublime color variations in a hip bruise, or the intricacies of a French bra, she loves to pile up descriptors and appellations to make catalogs to string together hyper-analytical figures. The poems embellish excessively, if you will, in the course of elegizing the lost marriage and probing the reason for its end and making something of the nothing it might have seemed. As they do so, the poems become exhilarating meditations, recollections, and with all celebrations, of the extremities 
of loneliness and love, and perhaps their inextricability. Sharon Olds. Wow, 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 wow. That's why one writes, why one lives, is for something so generous, beautiful, beautifully put, exhilarating, exuberant. Thank you. I'm very touched and very um, energized by that kind welcome. Hey, I'm in LA. This is, this is so cool. I've been here like, I don't know, about a half an hour. Um, yeah. Now, um, I'm looking forward to reading a few poems from Stag's Leap. And I, now I will start with one now that Stephen has so kindly uh, welcomed me with word of that. Oh, how's the sound? It feels good from here. And it was good there. Good. Uh, this evening is also for me my first reading since my new book was accepted by my editor. And so I'm going to be reading a bunch of those poems as well. And then in the middle, we're, if you like, we'll have a conversation, because I love to hear and talk and, um, you know, get the sense of where I am and where we are together and what we're doing. And um, so I'm, I'm, I was going to start with a poem uh, in case there was anyone in the room who had never been to a poetry reading before. But it just doesn't look like that to me. <laughs> so I'm going to jump in with an ode. My, my new, uh, is, it's a manuscript still, I guess, but it's become an accepted manuscript, is called Odes. It's a book of odes. And I, and Please don't ask me what an ode is, because I don't know. <laughs> and I feared that if I looked it up, that I would find out that I was actually not writing them, and I would get discouraged. <laughs> they began when I was in a bookstore, and I saw a book of Neruda's odes, Odes to Common Things. And I had read him and admired him, and, and I'd seen Il Postino a couple of times, but I'd never really got into his work for some reason. And this was Facing Page. And it, I just didn't really know that that could be done or had been done. Odes to Common Things. So, not planning to, but I, the next time I wrote, it, I wrote because I had seen this book. And later I'll read the first ode that I wrote, but I thought I would start with this one. Ode to the Clitoris. Little eagerness, flower girl basket of soft thorn and petal, near the entry of the satin column of the inner aisle, scout in the wilderness, wild ear which perks up, tender dowser which points, imp shape shifter, bench pressing biceps of a teeny goddess who is buff, lotus for grief, weensy Minerva who springs full armored, molten, I did not know you at seven. I thought you were God's way of addressing me when I kept swinging on the rings after the bell had rung. 
He didn't use his words, he used you to get my attention. He wrenched me and wrenched me then in six or seven wrenches of my body and brain, you, the tiny wrench which winched the wrenches. Later, you would do that without God, with boys, with kisses, and later you'd become an instrument of love's music. Today, I saw your portrait for the first time, your dorsal vein, your artery, your cavernous body, your vestibular bulb, your suspensory ligament, and I could see how evolution got the idea from you to invent a creature something like you, but a lot bigger. You were named for a Greek hill, Clinine, a slope. You are the ground of our being, the tiny figure of the human, the hooded stranger who comes to the door. And if we bless her, we will be blessed. And it just turned out I was totally in a mood to praise things. And I was also, uh, for about nine years, I was living in New Hampshire with a partner with whom I didn't feel it might be the right thing to write, uh, to, to publish, to read in public and publish intimate personal poems. I had felt it was totally the right thing to do all those years before, which I believe it had been. But I just wasn't sure, and so the pressure of praise built up and came out in these more general poems. Uh, I've never had a very strong sense of the abstract. Um, hi. Hi. Um, uh, I don't know what happened, if I developed one, or it developed me, or, or uh, what it was. As we see more of them, we'll have more sense of that tonight. But I, all, I don't want to read just Ode, so I also moved during this time. I'd lived 44 years in the same place, Upper West Side, New York. I moved downtown, and, and I wrote this poem. Um, and we were just talking about Deb Garrison, uh, in her second book, I think, wrote one of my favorite books about September 11th, 2001. Just an amazing poem. And um, this poem is called Looking South at Lower Manhattan, Where the Towers Had Been. If we see harm approaching someone, if you see me starting to talk about something I know nothing about, like the death of, a of someone who's a stranger to me, step between me and language. This morning, I am seeing it more clearly that song can be harmful in its ignorance, which does not know itself as ignorance. I have crossed the line as the line was crossed with me. I need to apologize to the letters of the alphabet, to the elements of the periodic table, to O and C and H, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, which make up most of a human body, body which breaks down in fire, to the elements it was composed of, and all that is left is ashes, sacred ashes of strangers, carbon and nitrogen. And the rest departs as carbon dioxide and is breathed in by those nearby, the living who knew us and the living who did not know us. I apologize to nitrogen, to calcium with the pretty box shape of its crystal structure, I apologize to phosphorus and potassium, that raw, bright metal we contain, and sodium and sulfur, and to the trace amounts which are in us somewhere, like the stars in the night, 
copper, zinc, cobalt, iron, arsenic, lead. I am singing. I am singing against myself, as if rushing towards someone my song might be approaching to shield them from it. So once I was living right close, right close, I just saw it in a different, I saw myself writing about what I don't know in a different way. Oh yeah. Um, then I'd like to read a poem from May 2010. I, I didn't know I was writing it a couple of months before our beloved Lucille Clifton was going to die. But I wrote it in a spirit of that time. You know, those, these poems we toss off because they just rise and flood over the edges out of us and that we don't maybe even think they will be real poems and we'll ever read them to anyone. Ode to My Living Friends, May 2010. What a long gap there has been between deaths. It seems as if none of those closest to us has gone for what seems months. For me, it's been so long that when I think of someone dying, I think of my mother and father my farriers out of nothing, out of the temporary rich something they were made of. I have carried them with me, not like a partial twin in a sling in front of and against me, but in my body, in my brain cells, but you, my friends, my chosen and chosen by ones. I see you as built-in aspects of the earth, like elements, like members of the periodic table. I know, we're mortal. The open door is there. But for weeks and weeks, I have forgotten that I'm going to lose every one of you until the ones who are left lose me. When I was a child, I could not have lost you. I did not know that I would find you. I'm blessed that it will happen to me. Before it does, let me say, you were exactly who I'd been looking for without daring to imagine. Breast that presses against other breasts, it was you. Root of washed sweet flag, timorous pond snipe, nest of guarded duplicate eggs, it was you. Hands I have taken, faces I have kissed, mortal I have ever touched. It was you. So that's for all of you, and of course we know who else it's from, who has gone from our poetry world in the last two years. It's just some of our dearest, dearest. And so I was glad to find this poem that I said to them, uh, whether I actually read it when they were around or not, but when they were alive. So now I'm going to read the first ode that I wrote when these odes came to me. I don't really know where anything is in this floppy manuscript yet. 27. Hmm. Yeah. Common things. So odes to common things. I was thinking, God, I could never do this. How does he do it? Ode to salt. Oh. <laughs> Ode to the dog. Ode to the table. Oh. But then this came to me. Ode to the tampon. <laughs> Inside out clothing. Queen's robe. White jacketed worker who clears the table prepared for the feast which goes uneaten, hospital orderly, straight jacket, which takes into its folded wings the spirit of the uncapturable one, soldier's coat, 
dry dock for the boat not taken, seeker of the red light of stars which have ceased to be before we see them, bloodhound, unhonored one, undertaker, secret keeper, you who in the cross-section diagram before the eyes of a girl child glide into potential space. Out of the second stage rocket's cardboard cylinder up beyond the atmosphere. Good evening. Is there, is there a lot of traffic tonight or something? Because people I'm expecting are not here. Uh, we were expecting, okay. Uh, well, I have to remind you about cell phones and uh, noise-making gizmos. Um, and if you're not on the mailing list for this series and would like to be, you can sign up at the table uh, near the entrance. Uh, I'm Stephen Yunser from the English Department at UCLA, which is one of the, the main sponsors of this series partly because we're fortunate enough to have the, uh, the aid of the Friends of English, which is an invaluable support group uh, that uh, helps the department out. Our other uh, sponsors include, and of course, obviously the museum, uh, UCLA's Cultural and Recreational Affairs. As I think you all know from her beginning, Sharon Olds has been one of our most remarkable poets of the body. She is, more narrowly, one of our most notably sensuous poets. And even more narrowly, she is one of our most erotic poets. <laughs> By which term I mean something like the antithesis of pornographic, uh, at least if that latter term implies, as its etymology suggests, prostitution or commerce. Eros really has to do on this hypothesis not with acquisition or with material exchange, not with holdings of any sort, but with desire, longing, Sehnsucht, with difference and separation and yearning. This is the case no less with uh, Sharon's most recent book, though its, uh, its subject is at the far end of the erotic experience. The volume is entitled Stag's Leap, and which is a winery, of course, as some of you I see know, and there is an allusion in the, in the title um, to that winery. Uh, and it's about uh, falling out of love. Uh, it's about divorce. Uh, divorce, uh, which as William Carlos Williams wrote, is the, the sign of knowledge in our time. <laughs> It's still our time. That's almost 100 years ago he said that. But it's... If the tone weren't all wrong, the book could have been called The X-Files. It's about the relationship between the poet and her ex, after all. But X is a notoriously polyvalent term. It stands for the, the unknown, not to mention the, the kiss in the email sign-off. Uh, or, or is that the O that's the kiss? I never know. Uh, it probably depends on how you kiss. <clears throat> and of course, for the uh, X for the contraries of multiplication and cancellation. Um, Sharon's poems, the new ones, feature what we might call the X qualities, foremost among which would be extravagance, by which I mean a wandering out of the way, an excursion into unfamiliar territory. One indication of their extravagance is their exuberance when it comes to diction. In the absence of the loved one, what the poet has, and what has even caused that absence, she sometimes seems to suspect, is her enthusiasm for her medium, Poem after poem is a cornucopia of rich, often rare terms, and time after time we are surprised by reckless turn of speech and exotic tropes. Whether she's conjuring the nearly indescribable sounds that sleepers make, or the sublime color variations in a hip bruise, 
or the intricacies of a French bra. She loves to pile up descriptors and appellations to make catalogs to string together hyper-analytical figures. The poems embellish excessively, if you will, in the course of elegizing the lost marriage and probing the reason for its end and making something of the nothing it might have seemed. As they do so, the poems become exhilarating meditations, recollections, and with all celebrations of the extremities of loneliness and love, and perhaps their inextricability. Chair Knowles. That's why one writes, why one lives, is for something so generous, beautiful, beautifully put, exhilarating, exuberant. Thank you. I'm very touched and very um, energized by that kind welcome. Hey, I'm in LA. This is, <laughs> this is so cool. I've been here like, I don't know, about a half an hour. Um, yeah. Now, um, I'm looking forward to reading a few poems from Stag's Leap. And I, now I will start with one now that Stephen has so kindly uh, welcomed me with word of that. Oh, how's the sound? It feels good from here. And it was good there. Good. Uh, this evening is also for me my first reading since my new book was accepted by my editor. And so I'm going to be reading a bunch of those poems as well. And then in the middle, we're, if you like, we'll have a conversation because I love to hear and talk and um, you know, get the sense of where I am and where we are together and what we're doing. And um, so I'm, I'm, I was going to start with a poem uh, in case there was anyone in the room who had never been to a poetry reading before, but it just doesn't look like that to me. <laughs> so I'm going to jump in with an ode. My, my new, uh, is, it's a manuscript still, I guess, but it's become an accepted manuscript, is called Odes. It's a book of odes. And, I, and please don't ask me what an ode is, because I don't know. <laughs> and I feared that if I looked it up, that I would find out that I was actually not writing them and I would get discouraged. <laughs> they began when I was in a bookstore and I saw a book of Neruda's odes, Odes to Common Things. And I had read him and admired him and, and I'd seen Il Postino a couple of times, but I never really got into his work for some reason. And this was Facing Page. And it, I just didn't really know that that could be done or had been done. Odes to Common Things. So, not planning to, but I, the next time I wrote, it, I wrote because I had seen this book and Later, I'll read the first ode that I wrote, but I thought I would start with this one. Ode to the Clitoris. <laughs> Little eagerness, flower girl basket of soft thorn and petal, near the entry of the satin column of the inner aisle, scout in the wilderness, Wild ear which perks up, tender dowser which points, 
imp shape shifter, bench pressing biceps of a teeny goddess who is buff, <laughs> lotus for grief, Weensy Minerva who springs full armored, molten, I did not know you at seven. I thought you were God's way of addressing me when I kept swinging on the rings after the bell had rung. He didn't use his words, he used you to get my attention. He wrenched me and wrenched me then in six or seven wrenches of my body and brain, you, the tiny wrench which winched the wrenches. Later, you would do that without God, with boys, with kisses, and later you'd become an instrument of love's music. Today, I saw your portrait for the first time, your dorsal vein, your artery, your cavernous body, your vestibular bulb, your suspensory ligament, and I could see how evolution got the idea from you to invent a creature something like you, but a lot bigger. You were named for a Greek hill, Clinine, a slope. You are the ground of our being, the tiny figure of the human, the hooded stranger who comes to the door. And if we bless her, we will be blessed. And it just turned out I was totally in a mood to praise things. And I was also, uh, for about nine years, I was living in New Hampshire with a partner with whom I didn't feel it might be the right thing to write, uh, to, to publish, to read in public and publish intimate personal poems. I had felt it was totally the right thing to do all those years before, which I believe it had been. But I just wasn't sure, and so the pressure of praise built up and came out in these more general poems. Uh, I've never had a very strong sense of the abstract. Um, hi. Hi. Um, uh, I don't know what happened, if I developed one, or it developed me, or, or uh, what it was. As we see more of them, we'll have more sense of that tonight. But I, all, I don't want to read just Ode, so I also moved during this time. I'd lived 44 years in the same place, Upper West Side, New York. I moved downtown, and, and I wrote this poem. Um, and we were just talking about Deb Garrison, uh, in her second book, I think, wrote one of my favorite books about September 11th, 2001. Just an amazing poem. And um, this poem is called Looking South at Lower Manhattan, Where the Towers Had Been. If we see harm approaching someone, if you see me starting to talk about something I know nothing about, like the death of, a of someone who's a stranger to me, step between me and language. This morning, I am seeing it more clearly that song can be harmful in its ignorance, which does not know itself as ignorance. I have crossed the line as the line was crossed with me. I need to apologize to the letters of the alphabet, to the elements of the periodic table, to O and C and H, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, which make up most of a human body, body which breaks down in fire, to the elements it was composed of, and all that is left is ashes, sacred ashes of strangers, carbon and nitrogen. And the rest departs as carbon dioxide and is breathed in by those nearby, the living who knew us and the living who did not know us, 
I apologize to nitrogen, to calcium with the pretty box shape of its crystal structure. I apologize to phosphorus and potassium, that raw bright metal we contain, and sodium and sulfur, and to the trace amounts which are in us somewhere, like the stars in the night, copper, zinc, cobalt, iron, arsenic, lead. I am singing. I am singing against myself, as if rushing towards someone my song might be approaching to shield them from it. So once I was living right close, right close, I just saw it in a different, I saw myself writing about what I don't know in a different way. Oh yeah. Um, then I'd like to read a poem from May 2010. I, I didn't know I was writing it a couple of months before our beloved Lucille Clifton was going to die. But I wrote it in a spirit of that time. You know, those, these poems we toss off because they just rise and flood over the edges out of us and that we don't maybe even think they will be real poems and we'll ever read them to anyone. Ode to My Living Friends, May 2010. What a long gap there has been between deaths. It seems as if none of those closest to us has gone for what seems months. For me, it's been so long that when I think of someone dying, I think of my mother and father my farriers out of nothing, out of the temporary rich something they were made of. I have carried them with me, not like a partial twin in a sling in front of and against me, but in my body, in my brain cells, but you, my friends, my chosen and chosen by ones. I see you as built-in aspects of the earth, like elements, like members of the periodic table. I know, we're mortal. The open door is there. But for weeks and weeks, I have forgotten that I'm going to lose every one of you until the ones who are left lose me. When I was a child, I could not have lost you. I did not know that I would find you. I'm blessed that it will happen to me. Before it does, let me say, you were exactly who I'd been looking for without daring to imagine. Breast that presses against other breasts, it was you. Root of washed sweet flag, timorous pond snipe, nest of guarded duplicate eggs, it was you. Hands I have taken, faces I have kissed, mortal I have ever touched. It was you. So that's for all of you, and of course we know who else it's from, who has gone from our poetry world in the last two years. It's just some of our dearest, dearest. And so I was glad to find this poem that I said to them, uh, whether I actually read it when they were around or not, but when they were alive. So now I'm going to read the first ode that I wrote when these odes came to me. I don't really know where anything is in this floppy manuscript yet. 27. Hmm. Yeah. Common things. So odes to common things. I was thinking, God, I could never do this. How does he do it? Ode to salt. Oh. <laughs> Ode to the dog. Ode to the table. Oh. But then this came to me. Ode to the tampon. 
Inside out clothing, queen's robe, white jacketed worker who clears the table prepared for the feast which goes uneaten, hospital orderly, straight jacket which takes into its folded wings the spirit of the uncapturable one, soldier's coat, dry dock for the boat not taken, seeker of the red light of stars which have ceased to be before we see them, bloodhound, unhonored one, undertaker, secret keeper, you who in the cross-section diagram before the eyes of a girl child glide into potential space. Out of the second stage rocket's cardboard cylinder up beyond the atmosphere where no one has gone before. <laughs> you who began life as a seed in the earth. You who blossomed into the air like steam from a whale's blowhole. You who were compressed into a dense calyx, nib which dips into a 40-year river, mute calligrapher, we write you here. And that was so different for, for me to address a general idea, as it were, um, that no four beat lines. I mean, it's, uh, it's like free verse. <laughs> and I write in four beat lines. And so f for me, that was how it looked on the page and how it felt was really, it really felt like something new. It was thrilling. That was in 2008. And then I just have been writing and writing and writing them and I'll read another one of them. Um, Ode to My Whiteness. This was inspired by Evie Shockley's great book, The New Black, amazing book, and one of my favorite poems ever is her poem in that book, Ode to My Blackness. And, uh, Evie and I read together at some events, and then uh, this poem came to me, thanks to Evie. Ode to my whiteness. You were invisible to me. You went without saying. You were my weapon secret from myself. Whatever I got, you helped get it for me. You were my ignorance. Because of you, I was not innocent. I did not see that. You were my blinding light. My dreams had a blank area in the center, taking up most of the screen they played on in my sleep, a blazing circle that blanked out the core of the scene. I thought it was my mother's violence, but it was you, too. You, the unseen fat which fed me in the wilderness. You, my Masonic handshake. You, my silence. You, my drone. You, my collaborator. You, my magician's cloak of steam. You, my dissembler. You, mine. I, yours, irisless eyeball. You, my blindness, sponsor of my helpless act. You, my stillness, my friend's blackness, a dancer, you, another, the two of you moving together. And then I always like to read a poem that I've never read before to anyone at a reading, and this one this is that one, you can kind of see. <laughs> it's better than it was early this afternoon. <laughs> and being here, um, I grew up in, I was born in San Francisco and I grew up in Berkeley. And um, uh, so for me, uh, uh, I saw a picture of New York City when I was seven 
uh, at night, black and white, all that light, all those little windows, all those neighbors, no houses. So you'd have people living above you and on both sides and below you, not your family, <laughs> other people. And I said, whoa. And I said, what's the name of this place? Uh, no, what is this place? What is this place? And uh, someone said, that is a place where no decent person would wish to live. <laughs> and I thought, there is a place for me. <laughs> That's my place. But of course, the ocean here and, uh, and the mountains, the clouds, the plants, just about everything. Um, it's very I'm very close to it. This is called holding to a wall, treading salt water. Holding to a wall, treading salt water, in my dream I turned, my back now to the open ocean, the biggest one, west of the city of my birth, which behind me now went to the horizon and beyond it, following the curve of the earth down and holding to the earth. I was about to swim back to land, but it was so far. I felt the power of the sliding body of water around me big as my mother when I was an egg inside her. No, a blastocele, no, a tiny seahorse embryo. And I thought, what if my mother could have been happy if I hadn't been born? What if she could have found true love, young, and become an opera star as she longed to be, and never going flat? Would I abort myself if that would have resulted in her ecstasy? People would die for their kids, and in a way, my mother was my giant baby I grew in and emerged from and took care of like a punishment child whore. Couldn't I give up my life for her? And for a moment I did. At last I had the power to make my mother happy. And then I cavorted quietly in the swell with my fellow embryos which had chosen their mother's lives over their own. We were as safe in matter as we would have been after dying of old age. I floated like a sea star. I floated like a lay in the wake of the boat from which we let go her ashes and most of the blossoms from her garden. At last I had not ruined her life. I had set my darling loose to sing like a god. I thought I was going to like that poem. I, it may be sick. It may be sick. It may be bad. I don't think it's that bad a poem, but it may be wicked. I don't know it well enough to know, but um, maybe, maybe you'll tell me. I'll read a poem from Stag's Leap, and then let's have a conversation, if you like. So this is one, this is an end, I call it an end of long marriage book. Um, uh, I don't know what, what I thought was wrong with the title divorce book. It just didn't feel like I felt. It didn't feel like I, I felt. End of long marriage, right? And um, I said to my grown children, I will not publish a book about any of this for at least 10 years. And this was just so they could have their own inner life about this event, which though they were grown was very surprising and new. So that they, you know, no one signs up, you know, when the lines of, of preconceived people are lining up, choosing their parents. The line for family poet is not very long. <laughs> so, so that worked out very well. Um, the poems are now maybe seven, some of them, the, the 
pr half of the book, or two-thirds, 17 years old. And this is one towards the end of the book called Years Later. At first glance, there on the bench where he'd agreed to meet, it didn't seem to be him. But then the face of grim friendliness was my former husband's, like the face of a creature looking out from inside its knocks. No fault, no knock, clever nut of the hearing aid hidden in the ear I do not feel I love anymore. Small bandage on the cheek, peopled with tiny lichen from a land I don't know. We walk. I had not remembered how deep he held himself inside himself, my fun for 32 years to lure him out. I still kind of want to, as if I see him as a being with a baby paw caught. His voice is the same, low, still pushed around the level bubble in his throat. We talk of the kids, and it's as if that will never be taken from us. But it feels as if he's not here, though he's here. It feels as if, for me, there's no one there. As when he was with me, it seemed there was no one there for any other woman for the first 30 years. Now I see I've been hoping each time we meet that he would praise me for how well I took it, but it's not to be. Are you happy as you thought you'd be? I ask. Yes. And his smile is touchingly pleased. I thought you'd look happier, I say. But after all, when I am looking at you, you're with me. We smile his eyes warm a moment with the accustomed shift, as if he's turning into the species he was for those 30 years, and turning back. I glance toward his torso once, his legs. He's like a stick figure now, the way when I was with him, other men seemed like Ken dolls, all clothes. Even the gleam of his fresh wedding ring is no blade to my rib. This is married Ken. As I walk him toward his street, I joke, and for an instant he's alive toward me, a gem of sea of pond in his eye. Then the retreat into himself, which always moved me, as if there were a sideways gravity in him toward some vanishing point. And no, he does not want to meet again in a year. When we part, it is with a dry bow and goodbye. And then there is the spring park, damp as if freshly peeled, sweet greenhouse, green cemetery with no dead in it, except in some shaded woods, under some years of leaves and rotted cones, the body of a warbler, like a whole note fallen from the sky, my old love for him, like a songbird's rib cage picked clean. There we go. <laughs> so let's have a conversation. There is a microphone. So if you just want to say something or ask something. Please wait for the microphone, too. Yes, it will come, it will come to you. And while, you're, uh, while, it is, while that's happening, I thought it was obvious that that book was by someone who was not angry enough. I thought that was obvious. I thought it was in several of the poems. There was something wrong with the narrator of this book. Not able to have that anger that we would have for a friend in the same situation. So that's what I thought. <laughs> yes, good, hi. Hi, um, what do you find the most difficult kinds of poems to write about family or about other kinds of situations? Cool, could you hear that? What do you find the most difficult kinds of poems to write? Good poems, right? 
And, and I don't think that, I don't think it's that there's a particular category besides that, that for me. I mean, I think that poems of sexual love or probably poems of sex without love are um, hard to write well, you know, but if you're totally interested in that subject and in writing about that subject, I just couldn't believe it's like if you get the football and you want to go that way and there's no one in your way, it's like, where did everybody go? So writing about sexual love was just something that I felt blessed that it was there to, there to do, because I really was interested in doing that. So not, not what you call easy, not easy to do well, but, but just very interesting. So I think that when I do my worst writing on any subject is when I'm most, um, uh, um, well, if I don't understand what I'm talking about, that's hard. But then if I can't un, you know, I don't know if cars still have neutral. That used to be a gear that cars had. <laughs> and it's, if there's a thing that happens that is a little like slipping into neutral so that my will is not too vigorously engaged. And um, so, but I don't know how to make that happen really, except you know, exercise and drink a lot of water, sleep, and, uh, you know, not drink too much wine, and for me, no drugs. You know, we each know what brings out our better writing, but except for that, it's a great question. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's connected with subject so much poems about one's own children, well, then you just put them in a drawer. So writing, uh, that's what I do now. Uh, so writing them, well, that could happen. But then you just might not bring them out into the world. I might not for a while. Thank you. Thank you, oh, Hermes the messenger. Can you say more about what you just now said about putting them in a drawer? I understand that your sexuality and your sexual poems are kind of your own private business. But when it comes to your maternal poems, your poem, by the way, Grown Children, is just a gift. And I thank you for it more times than I can tell What you. is that? Grown Children. Your poem, Grown Children. I don't even remember. Oh, it's the one. I'll look it up. Thank you. <laughs> I accept. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's such a gift, but I'm just Thank wondering you. when you say you put those poems in a drawer, and yet I know, because I, I'm, I really glom onto your maternal poems, that you write about that background figure, that source figure, the mother, in one of your poems. And the mother is so present in so many of your poems, and yet you're saying you put them in a drawer to protect your dear ones, can you say more about that? I'm really interested. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough one. I agree with you that it's really different from writing about one's parents, one's partners, uh, even one's siblings. Um, yeah, oneself, certainly. Um, I never thought anyone would read my poems, you know. When we're first writing our poems, if we haven't had a poem published, we don't think we're ever going to. Uh, and um, yeah, no, I don't think I am very good at feeling private. Um, I mean, as a person in, my, in terms of my life, I kind of am. I think I just had this thing about if it was art, it was so different from life. Muriel Rukeyser used to ask groups like this, um, she would say, I am looking for stories of people who have been harmed by art. Because she was accused of being much too, and her family, really. Um, uh, and she couldn't find one. So I'm, I'm, I've been continuing that work. 
uh, people harm, not their feelings hurt, not them getting angry and saying, stop it. And, you know, uh, once that happens, it would be very hard for me not to stop, you know. But at the same time, what my experience has been is that uh, at some point they might say, stop, and then you stop and then you get uh, teased for the rest of your life, which hopefully will be a very long one full of much teasing for, um, you know, uh, how it felt for them to be kids of a, of a poet who wrote about them. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not really giving you much of an answer at all. <laughs> I know what I, I, I know what's right for me to do is write those poems, write those poems. And then who knows what will happen or when I'm now in the position of if my, uh, my, my stuff is getting archived and it will be auctioned and then how long to seal it for. Clearly to me, I have to seal it, but for how long? And other poets and I who have written about children talk about that. Yeah, it's super important. I wish we could, I would, I would like to do something really creative with it and good and positive that would involve being able to write, but I don't think I can. I think it's hard enough for me to try to be accurate when no one else is going to be approving or not approving. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. I will. Yes, hi, hi. Oh, here first and then hi. 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 Uh, well, most professional writers try to write every day. And um, I'm wondering if you feel like you ever go through periods where you really have to defend your, your time writing poetry, or if you feel like the rest of your life kind of comes in and starts to take over, and you need to really, like I said, de defend that time. Um, do you manage to, to work on your, your poems every day? I don't try to. Um, I only write a poem when a poem has come to me. When I see, I owed, owed to the tampon, holy shit, yes. Uh, but so to me, if, that's a, if a poem comes to me, if I think up a poem, then I'm going to try to do that. But, you know, I was a full-time mother, which was a great thing for me. So there were absolutely times when you drop the poem uh, and do what needs to be done, and then you go back to the poem. Certainly, if, if, I, if I'm due in class, I, I don't say, oh, I'll be there in a few minutes, I'm writing a poem. You know, first things first. But at the same time, I manage to get a lot, and as you get older, it gets easier, for, at least for me, in the way my teaching life is set up and all the good fortune I've had in being able to organize my time on the plane here today and then in this wonderful room at this wonderful hotel where I could see the mountains and the light and a eucalyptus tree. And I, I, like, I, I like writing a lot. It, I like how it feels physically, and I like the, the there's, it's a little peaceful and a little exciting. So uh, I've heard a lot of fiction writers sit down and write for a specific number of hours, and I can see that their task, their art, might lead to that. Um, I write in my diary a lot, but only when I need to which is sometimes about like 10 hours a day, because it's a diary. It's for you know people who either or both love to describe things and or don't understand themselves or their life. And I fit into all those categories. Yeah, and then often a poem will come out of the diary. Yeah, thank you. So let's, these two over here, if you would, sir, and uh, Okay, yeah, we have time for these two and maybe one more, and then, hi. Hi, a uh, similar writing question. Do you write a lot of drafts first, or is it pretty much like the first draft and then you edit it, or has that changed over the years significantly, that process? 
one thing I, that comes to mind right away is that I don't free write and then go back. I write in lines and I try to get the right words, which means there's a lot of crossing out. Uh, uh, you know, it's about four manuscript, pa four notebook, grocery store notebook pages is what it is, wide ruled. If I put in a word, this is just about me. I, this is not like how to do it. If I put in a word to hold another word's place that I trust will come along, um, the word I've chosen has its own music, and it starts calling to all of its rhyming friends, saying, come, come. And then if it gets taken out because it wasn't right, the music of the poem is compromised, which happens to a lot of my poems, because to be accurate, to try to be accurate, is more important to me even than the music. Yes, that's true. Um, but I generally write, I always write it in one sitting, which uh, you, is sometimes a, in, a, in a kind of slow rush, I would say. And then if I like it well enough, which is probably one out of 10 of the poems I write, I write just a huge amount, most of which no one ever sees. Maybe by now I've got it down to five, or maybe my taste is deteriorating, so <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, but then I will type it up. And once I type it up, it's usually semi-clear to me whether it will be good enough ever to show anyone. And then I can be quite wrong. But usually if it reaches an ending, then I'm going to care about it. If it comes to something different from where it was in the beginning, I'm, I'm going to do what I need to do. And then sometimes, I, I use a computer now as a typewriter, and then I print out and I do my rewrites, uh, just the whole dance of, uh, Lucille wrote her poems, her first drafts, on an electric typewriter. I don't have a hang up about anybody uh, doing it one way or another, but for me, the, just to have the physical self involved is a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And there was one, hi. Hi, um, what poets are you currently reading? My students. And I happen to have just astonishing graduate writing students at NYU. Uh, and uh, that really is who I'm reading. But I mean, they are Good, good, good. We are very lucky there that NYU came around and started, it, they didn't come around. We have a great director herself, a wonderful poet, Deborah Landau. And uh, she's very cool, very cool poet, daring, interesting poet. And she's the director of creative writing. And somehow, uh, we, we have more money than we used to have. So we would choose the people who would apply and, and often they would have to go somewhere else where they got money, duh. They could live for a couple of years as poets on that stipend. So now we, we have much better luck with that. And, um, and many of them also are teaching in the outreach programs that go out from NYU, the program at the hospital for the severely physically challenged, where many of some to many of the writers are non-moving and non-speaking. And our graduate writing students are their teachers and their life companions. We learn as much from their character as they do from our poetry stuff. And there's one also at a children's oncology ward. The one at the hospital is now in its 30th year. <laughs> uh, and um, the one that's in its sixth year now is the um, writing workshop for veterans of the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. And this past year, I had in my graduate writing workshop one of the uh, people who had taken that workshop as a vet and then applied to the program. And so I, I could just go on about the whole community a lot. Do we have time for one more? Good, OK. Thank you so much, first of all, for all your words over the years.
You're um, so I have, welcome. I have um, a question just about the relationship between your language and then the mood that your poems My language conjure, and what? And the mood that the poems conjure for me as yes, a reader at least. Right. I thought you said, and the moon, and I thought, oh, how <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> yes, the moon. Okay, yes, the language and the mood. Um, the language is so very precise and accurate, but the mood is often so ambiguous. That, to me, is the, such the beauty of your poems. And I wonder if the ambiguity is on purpose, <laughs> or if that's something that you aim for, or is that something that just suffuses the, the I poems think, th first of all, thank you. Second of all, I think I don't know much about ambiguity. I think I don't notice it in my poems. I think there are things we have mixed feelings about, certainly. So there would be ambiguity. I somehow got through my, my PhD exams. They, 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 they courteously once and discourteously another time suggested I just leave. <laughs> but I, I, I wouldn't do that. And during my exams, I tried to say, ambiguous and ambivalence, and twice said, ambulance, ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I love that you said that. No one's ever said that to me before. That's a new idea for me. And um, I just don't know. But I'll read a few more poems uh, uh, to close our hour together, and then and we'll see. We'll see. Okay, so, yes. Hmm. Uh, I have noticed since this book got taken, this is a feminist book. Oh, my God. I just can't hide it anymore. <laughs> This book is pissed off <laughs> and happy and celebratory, but it's a, uh, it's, it's so. Ode to the Penis. Someone told me that what I write about men is objectifying. So I ask you, O oh general idea of the penis, do you mind being noticed? <laughs> you who stand in the mind erect and not, old and young, for all your representations, O oh abstract principle, haven't you maybe been waiting for your turn to be sung? I think you're lovely and brave and so interesting. You are like a creature with your head and trunk, as if you have a life of your own. But you are innocent. You are not your own man. You are no more responsible for your actions than the matter of the brain for its thoughts. And you've had a mixed history. You've been taken into carnage as the instrument of it and you yourself have been played to produce the desperate screams. Often you have not been protected, nor used to protect, and oft not been respected, nor wielded to respect. And yet most of your history has been spent in joy. And I wonder how it has felt being so adored as you have been and feared and what is it like for you if you could look down from your platonic cloud of categories when two of you are engaged together or married, yourself primed, yourself to your own power? And being a concept, are you smart? Do you know you're equal to your sister concept? and even that you came from her back at the invention of the separate male, the ovaries heavying down towards the earth, the organ of orgasm growing and growing. I cannot imagine you from within, but as a sage said of a god, I do not 
want to be sugar, I want to taste sugar. But that's just my heteromania talking. <laughs> and you're not homo or hetero or visible or manifest. You do not exist except as an imaginary quorum of all your instances. So I'm not flirting with you. I'm just saying I like you, not as an object but a subject a prime mover, a working theory of plumbing and ecstasy, a boy's pride and anxiety, wind sock of zephyr and gale, half of the equation of creation. Oh, yes, and I, I have, yeah. So I'll read two more poems. This is called Suddenly. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the amazing poems of Ruth Stone. I bet a lot of you are. Whereas in you know some audiences you wouldn't find that. But this is um, this is uh, an elegy for Ruth. It's called Suddenly. And suddenly, it's today. It's this morning. They are putting Ruth into the earth. Her breasts going down under the hill like the moon and sun going down together. Oh, I know, it's not Ruth. What was Ruth went out slowly, but this was her form, beautiful and powerful as the old gorgeous goddesses who were terrible, too, not telling a lie for anyone. And she'd been left here so long among mortals by her mate who could not one hour bear to go on being human. And I've gone a little crazy myself with her going, which seems to go against logic, the way she has always been there with her wonder and her generousness, her breasts like two voluptuous external hearts. I am so glad she kept them all her life and she got to be buried in them. She, 96, and they, maybe 82 each, which is 164 years of pleasure and longing. And think of all the poets who have suckled at her riskiness, her risque, her body politic, her outlaw grace. What she came into this world with, with a mew and cry, she gave us in her red sweater and her red hair and her raw, melodious Virginia crackle. She emptied herself fully out into her songs and our song making. We would not have made our songs without her. Oh, dear one, what is this? You are not a child, though you dwindled. You have not retraced your path but continue to move straight forward to where we will follow you, radiant mother, red rover, cross over. Oh yeah, okay, I know the one I wanna close with. You feel so good to read to, you folks, you folk. And when I said, people said, well, where are you going on your trip? And I said, I'm going to read at the hammer. Oh, the hammer. Cool. You're going to read at the hammer. <laughs> now, where is it? Oh, I remember where it is. It's the first one. Not the first one I wrote. I couldn't have ever written it without writing all those others. I'm going to have to take it out because I like to be able to look at you when I'm to look up. And this is not a very bendable-y thing. Yeah. Ode to the Hymen. <laughs> I don't know when you came into being inside me when I was inside my mother. 
maybe when the involuntary muscles were setting like rose jello. I love to think of you then, so whole, so impervious, you and the clitoris as safe as the lives in which you were housed. They would have had to kill both my mother and me to get at either of you. I love her at this moment as the big fortress around me, the matron head around the sweet meat of my maiden head. I don't know who invented you to keep a girl's inwards clean and well cupboarded. Dear wall, dear gate, dear style, dear Dutch door, not a cat flap nor a swinging door, but a one-time pinata. <laughs> How many places in the body were made to be destroyed once? You were very sturdy, weren't you? You took your job seriously. I'd never felt such pain. You were the woman the magician saws in two. I was proud of you, turning to a cup full of the bright arterial ingredient. And how lucky we were, you and I, that we got to choose when and with whom and where and why plush pin cushion, somehow related to statues that wept. It happened on the rug of a borrowed living room, but I felt as if we were in Diana's woods, he and I and you together, or as if we were where the magma from the core of the earth burst up through the floor of the sea. Thank you for your life and death. Thank you for your flower girl walk before me, throwing down your scarlet petals. It would be years before I married, years before I carried within me a tiny baby hymen, near the eggs with other teensy hymens within them. But you unscrolled the carpet, leading me into the animal life of a woman. You were a sort of blood mother to me, First you held me close for 18 years, and then you let me go.